Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, here's the show you've tuned in to see. Thank you. Thank you. So, My microphone's okay. weird, but I'm going to be cool with it. It's can you, and everybody can hear perfectly? I would think you can hear, they can hear too much. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Hear my breathing. The, see, it took a lot to get out here. Um, Hi, Larry. David. We've known each other a long, long time. For such a young man. David is uh, just turning, can I say it? 59 on Thursday. That's yeah. true. I never know what the applause means in that. Is it now? I guess it's that you made it to 59. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, our friend James Newton Howard, it's the same day. Same, same day, same yeah, birthday. Absolutely. Yep. So you have to remember that day. Um, so David's new book is wonderful and comes out tomorrow. Is that right? Yes. And it's his second novel. Am I correct? The first one is also great. And as with everything David writes, it's going to be a movie. Right? Cold Storage was the first one. Aurora is this one. He's an amazing storyteller. And we've had many conversations about the story. I remember one time I showed him a screenplay I'd written. And uh, he said, it's, it's good, it's good. You know, it's very encouraging. And he said, but uh, it needs one more thing. And if I had known that one more thing, I would have put it in the screen originally. <laughs> That's a really but annoying comment. I really it, said that. Well, he was, he was absolutely right. I didn't find that one more thing, and the screenplay sucked, and the movie didn't do very well. If only. If only you'd listen to me. <laughs> yeah. um, th exactly. That's not, I feel like that I must spring to my own defense about that note. Because yes. it's, it's not quite as annoying as all that. I, yeah. I, I have this theory, and I was, it sounds like you were you walked in when I was in the middle of formulating this big theory I was very excited about, yeah. which is that movie ideas, or maybe any artistic idea, but I know movies, um, are the collision, are, you need two big ideas. Two? I think so. So I, I only had like one idea. I think you maybe had the one, <laughs> wow. but it needed the other one, which was, oh yeah, and he's epileptic, you yes. know, or whatever the other idea would have been. Yes. But it's the, it's, the, it's the collision of a couple big ideas that really put it on its feet. That was my theory at the time. No, that was good, but I thought you meant, you know, it, I had four and I needed a fifth, and that <laughs> really stymied me. But there's a million ways to screw up. Uh, how many of you want to write screenplays, have written screenplays? Why are you here? Lots, lots, good. It's hard work, isn't it? <laughs> hard to get yourself to do it, and we'll talk about that because David is one of the most prolific writers I've ever met. He seems, we were talking just now about, for me it's miserable, it's a miserable activity to go in a room alone <laughs> and spend all day alone and think about, is this gonna, am I doing it right? And uh, is this gonna be any good? And it's so isolating. I love directing. Directing, you go out and there's all these people and they just wanna make you happy. And they say, <laughs> hey, they're so happy to see you, you know? <laughs> hey, Larry, no matter what they think, they're, Larry, hey, how are you? And, um, but writing, no one does that. You go in this room, it's quiet, you work like hell, and nothing may come of it, which is, that's sort of frustrating. But you seem to just enjoy it, and you keep turning out a lot of stuff. Tell me how you do that. Um, well, I feel largely the opposite <laughs> of, of, of what you do, and I, I've directed as well, um, but I think our, what you just said 
aside from raw talent, may be the big difference in why your films are artistically so incredibly successful and wonderful, and mine are you know pretty good. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a big difference. I hate it. I hate dire I hate everything about directing except editing because I'm once again in a room alone. Um, I really love being in a room alone with a slinky trying to make up, since I quit smoking, um, <laughs> trying to make up a story. I really love that time wow. and going for a walk and figuring something out and all the alone time I, is, is where I'm happy. And when you're on the set, what is it you don't like about it? People. I, <laughs> <laughs> the problem is they come up to you and try to do stuff for you. <laughs> and I don't like that. And they have a lot of questions, um, which is okay with me sometimes. They also have a lot of opinions, which is not really okay with me. And uh, no, I mean, I exaggerate a little, but I, I, really, I realized on the first movie I directed why a lot of film directors wear a baseball cap. And it's because of the brim. It's because you're trying to, and this is my theory again, because you're trying to think. You're in the middle of trying to solve some thorny problem, like how do I get her to walk from here to the door and still blah, blah, blah. And someone wants to catch your eye to hold up two things and say red or blue, and you're convinced you've never met that person before in your life. And, and I think the brim is to just let no one look at you. And that's just no attitude to direct a film. Yes. Um, so I think we just and That's not it. embracing the process. It's really not. So we it's, do, it's obvious, it's opposite. So you like is. being in that room, you like going on a walk, trying to figure out, and I'm like, why, what? What can we do here? I don't know. What's, what did Kep mean when I needed another thing? I'm completely <laughs> lost. I scarred you with that note. So, I'd really yeah, like so, to apologize. Um, no, I really enjoy the, the process of making up stories and the first couple of drafts where it's mostly, whether it's a book or, or a screenplay, where it's mostly just you and the story and you're trying to wrestle it to the ground. Um, that's the part I love. And the rest I do so that I can get back to doing that again. Well, you have worked with the biggest directors in the world, and sometimes several times. What is that like for you? Because here you've written something in isolation, if you're not directing it yourself. And here's these people, and they have a huge reputation. And they're questioning everything, because they don't understand. I, I realize that the few times I've had someone else direct stuff, that, um, you think everything's obvious, but it's not obvious to them. And they'll ask you questions, you think like, wait, why are you even doing this movie if you don't understand that? Right. How do you deal with it when it's Steven Spielberg, when it's Ron Howard, when it's Brian De Palma? It isn't so much the questions they ask, because I do feel like we're constantly, whether you wrote it for someone else or you're writing and directing it, you are constantly the script's attorney. And you're, you're defending it against these vicious attacks that come from all sides. <laughs> and you're trying to say, no, 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 it does make perfect sense because you know, it's something you just made up. Yes. And, and, uh, or you're, you, know, you take something on board and say, OK, I get it. Let me, let me work. Please don't try to solve it. Please, <laughs> please stop. Uh, let me work on that, and I'll try to figure it out. Uh, those, are, those are fine. What's harder is, and I think is more of a craft, is trying to get inside the head of the director and see it from their point of view and try and do it in the way they see it. And it, it requires, you really got to sort of bottle your own ego. But I, I spent enough years trying to fight with directors to convince them that they needed to do it my way and, and having that not succeed. Because they either, when you try to talk a director into something, not, most of the time they just won't, because if they're any good, they won't, because they don't see it, and they can't do it if they don't see it. Um, the times they do try to do it, though they didn't see it, it's not very good, because they didn't see it. So they got to make it their own, and I, I, I usually, around the third draft, I say a little goodbye to it, um, because it's no longer mine. Now it's going to be theirs, and I try to see it the, the way they see it. And that way is usually always different from how I would see it. Yeah. Well, that's very healthy, that attitude, to let it go. Yes and no. 
<laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's on the one hand very healthy in that, well, this is the way the, it is, and it's a, it is a director's medium. I mean, we're vital. Uh, they can't do it without us. But, but, it is that, but I am here to support them by this point, um, on the one hand. On the other hand, am I, am I, you know, I going to rot inside because I'm doing something I don't believe in? Yeah. And if you truly feel that way, you should quit right away because of You mean you quit uh, the profession? Well, I wasn't going to go that far. But, <laughs> but, but, uh, you should quit that job? You quit that job. Let someone else do it. You know, mm -hmm. say, you know, I, I, I'd love to help if I could. I just don't, I don't see it. So I think you should get somebody who does. Mm -hmm. But well, those are hard to say because usually then they say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> you know what? I'll just do it. <laughs> well, um, I just want to, before we go on with this, I want to well, Can I interrupt you yeah, and ask you about, Sure. because you decided early yeah. you didn't want to write for other people. No. And you're going to have to come to terms, by the way, with the fact that most of the people here would way rather hear what you have to no, say no, than no, what no, I do. No, no, no. No, we, do, we, we disagree. <laughs> so, but you decided early on, I don't want to write, you know, you had some no. uh, rather notable successes there, and it was, all, it was all going great. And you said, I only want to write and direct. Is that no. what you, was that a choice at that moment, no, or did it evolve was, that way? I think it had, I, I wanted to direct, that was the whole goal all along. And the writing was going to be a way to have that happen. Mm -hmm. And then um, here's a perfect example. It was the first screening of, ever of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Tiny little room, you know, a tenth of the people that are here. You know, the head of the studio, Stephen, you know, and um, at Goldwyn Studios. And I'm watching, and my wife came with me. This is one of my first, not the first, but one of my first movies that's been made. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, it sucks. <laughs> they ruined everything. I had it all up here, it was so clear in my head. And why didn't they do any of that? They ruined it. And I think it took me 10 years to get, and no, they didn't ruin it. It's they, actually, <laughs> I think it they actually did works a much pretty well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And it's hard to let go, and what yeah. you say, you know, and to say, oh, Steven Spielberg had some good ideas here. Just so, you, just so you know, I'm not all that healthy. I was on Spider-Man, which was a torturous process. I was hired and fired three times. You wow. know, it was got 30 or 40 drafts of it in a box somewhere. And, and I was at a test screening of it. It came down to, I was, I was, I was I, I, there was a structural thing I didn't like. Yeah. I didn't feel it should go to blah, blah, after blah, blah, and that's why it has to be written that way. And in, in the screening I saw, it, it, it was structured the way I did not want uh, or approve of. And I thought that it was horrible, and I stormed out and wouldn't speak to anyone. <laughs> and, you know, and, I, and then the movie opened and the reviews were like, you know, 99% positive or something. And all I could bring myself to say was, Imagine it, how well it would have done if you'd, fi if you'd, <laughs> <laughs> if you'd fixed the structure. That's great. There was a story when I was in college about a kid who goes to a course. He goes every, um, he goes the first day. He listens, and then he never comes back until the final. And uh, he comes back, takes the final. And the professor calls him in. He says, uh, what happened here? You never came to any classes, you got 99 out of 100 correct answers. What happened? And he says, uh, well, you know, that first day you could sort of confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so that is sort of, you know, I think that's true. You don't know. I mean, when you're seeing it, you don't know yeah. if it's working. And when you've seen someone has reinterpreted your ideas, you've made the movie in your head, which true for everybody. You make it in your head, and then who, if you're lucky enough to have someone make it, they're making it different. Every single it's thing different. they do is different. Right, you know, it's, yes, it's, whether better or worse, it's different. Uh, De Palma always, I did three movies with De Palma, a scene was invariably the exact opposite spatially of the way <laughs> I saw it in my head. Always, every single time. And on the third movie, I was on the set one day, and 
he, he looked at me and said, do you want to be here? And I said, oh, God, no. I thought you wanted me here. And he said, no, it's depressing. <laughs> look over at your face. So, so I went home. Well, tell me about that collaboration, because I, I know Brian, and we've known each other a long time, but what is it, do you think, that made that collaborate? And you're still very good friends. We're, we're still very good friends, but we, didn't, we did three in a row in the 90s and then um, didn't find common ground again. We're, I just our viewpoints are very, very different. Yeah, I don't world. see you I don't, I, I don't know that anyone shares Brian's viewpoint. He's, <laughs> he's just a very singular, you know, yes. kind of guy. And so it was, we tried one once or twice after that, but, you know, I, we just... What I, do you think the difference is? Because I would guess, I'll tell you what I think, but you tell me, what, how are you so different? I think that to be somewhat hopeful and optimistic about humanity is a choice. And it gets, it's a choice that gets harder as you get older. And I don't think Brian wants to make that choice. And he may be <laughs> right. It's certainly easy to, to make a persuasive case about man's dark side, yes. humankind's dark side. So I just think it got a... He, he got darker, I got lighter, I guess. I and we both know Ron Howard, and I would say he epitomizes a more positive point of view. Yeah. And did you sure. find that too? You, how many times have you worked with Ron? Um, three uh, there. I, I feel that one was, uh, The Paper was a movie we did uh, that was about a newspaper in New York, and it's funny and fun and ensemble, and it's about a tabloid newspaper. The other two were the uh, Dan Brown adaptations, which are great experiences but you're in it's you know you're in somebody else's world and you're in in this case dan brown's world which is a very specific thing um so i don't feel you're necessarily you know your own personality is not necessarily flying you're trying to apply craft you're uh, sometimes there are some jobs there are some movies you do where i feel like this is this is my thing, and this is coming out of me someplace. And there's other jobs I feel like um, I'm building a, a set of kitchen cabinets for somebody, and I want them to be the best cabinets ever. But it's very important to ask them, where do you want the cabinets? <laughs> you know, because they're for them. Yes. And so I feel like you're that, those, those two, I feel like Ron and I both were applying as much craft as we possibly could to someone else's universe. Yes. Uh, to use the parlance of our times, man. And how many times have you worked with Steven? Uh, on movies he's directed four, and um, three others as, you know, like a producer or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Two I directed that he... Uh, to produced. go back to Brian's worldview, I, we won't mention the name of the movie, but you told me something that just flabbergasted me just a few months ago, which was... You went to a movie with him. We won't say what it was. But why can't? Because it's hard to tell the story without saying. All right, you can tell. I don't think it's it's it's. I don't think know that the filmmaker would even disagree. All right. So the movie was Nightmare Alley. Brian Nightmare and I, Alley. Brian, did you see the new Nightmare Alley, the Guillermo del Toro, del yes. Toro movie, which is brilliant? There you it go. is a brilliant film. It is gorgeous. It does not necessarily lean into what is hopeful or optimistic <laughs> uh, about humanity. And the movie ended, and Brian said, <laughs> that was a little dark and perverse for me. <laughs> Brian De Palma. And I almost spit out my uh, popcorn. I said, holy shit, Brian. Uh, I just felt that was. That's pretty dark. <laughs> now, well, we won't do too much of this, and tell me if I ruin this microphone thing, but tell me how you got from Wisconsin to where we are today. What did you want? Did you want to direct movies? Did you want to write movies? Did you want to write novels? What, did you, what were you thinking when you were a young man? And I wanted to write movies. I started uh, when I was you know, young. I, I, was a, I was a very bad, I had very bad penmanship. The nuns said no one will ever be able to read your handwriting. So my dad brought a typewriter home from the office and I started typing. <clears throat> and I thought, well, I should write some stories. So I wrote short stories when I was in high school and stuff. And then I wanted to be an actor, but then I got to college and I realized, you know, I'm not very good. And really, the people who are better looking tend to get all the parts, <laughs> you know, which is, I get it, you know, it's okay. Um, but I started writing plays and I really enjoyed that. And 
but I found it limiting. The, you know, people sit in rooms and talk all the time, and I wanted 37 scenes. So I, you know, you meet a, if you meet a, someone, if you meet some like-minded people at the right point in your late teens, early 20s, it's really important. And I think that's the real value of, of a film school environment. It's not necessarily the faculty, you know, though they can be good, but it's the people you meet who want to do what you want to do, and all they want to do is talk about that and nothing else. Yeah. And you'll trade scripts with them, and all they want, they, they, ideally you'll be kind to each other, not just because it's good to be kind, but because you know that you're going to give them your, theirs, or you know, yeah. you're going to exchange. So in three weeks, if you're cruel, yeah. they're coming for you. Yeah. And so I found some very you know, supportive friendships when I was at Madison, Wisconsin, one or two other people that wanted to write scripts. So then I applied to film schools because I realized quickly, Madison's great if you want to you know, do mushrooms and talk politics uh, yeah. the rest of your life. <laughs> And that's fun and for who a while. Doesn't? Yeah, who doesn't? But, but, but you know, not they don't make movies there. How long did you stay at Wisconsin? I was there uh, three years, mm -hmm. and then applied to UCLA as a junior because uh, I had a leisurely pace through college. And uh, so I got into film school at UCLA and came out and started writing here. Um, but I, Los Angeles wasn't completely new to me. I'd had family here. My my uncle. Um, was an actor, a character actor who was in, um, you know, TV shows and movies in the 50s, 60s, 70s, really? 80s. Claude Akins, I don't know. If oh my God! Didn't he's I what? Tell you that? He's what to you? He and my dad were fraternity brothers at Northwestern, and they married sisters. Uh, they met a couple. Another fraternity brother of theirs said, "Hey, I'm Irish Catholic. I got like seven <laughs> sisters. You should come home and meet them." So they went home, married two of them. I'm compacting things a little. And, uh, and wow. he and Claude were, were buddies. Claude was always very, very nice to me. Now, did, how many people here know who Claude Aikens was? Because he is a great character actor. You'd know his you, face if yeah, you saw him. If you saw you, his you've face, seen him you'd in say, a lot oh, I've seen that guy a hundred times. Killed by John Wayne three times, he liked to say. <laughs> yeah. he, and he was superb. Yeah, he I mean, was very, very And good. he's in many, many movies that I love. But what he... What I, so, so the idea that you could be from somewhere else in the country, in his case, Georgia, mine, Wisconsin, and you know, pack up your suitcase and go to Hollywood to seek your fortune, the idea was not insane to me. I had seen someone do it, so, or her. Yeah, that helps a lot. Yeah, and that helps a lot. I, I've often wondered you know, why all these major league leaguers, their kids make it to the majors, and NBA, their kids make it to the NBA. And while a normal, you know, an average person coming from nowhere, it's a million to one. Mm -hmm. But if you're, someone is in it already, everything gets easier. You're in the locker room. You see the disappointment. You see the hard work. And it seems to grease the I way. think it helps. But you, you also have to be, I think there's a lot of people who are the children of people who made it in one difficult profession or another who don't succeed. Obviously, there are. And part of what you have to have, though, is you have to have the ability to withstand the shit that's going to be thrown at you, because mm -hmm. there's a lot. And I've seen some very good writers, actors, you know, people I've known who decided, who stopped pursuing it, not because they weren't any good at it, but they chose not to, not to take the, not only the rejection, but also the, the, the crap. Yeah. And, and so. So let's say there's some people out here that are on the fence. You know, they've been trying, they're, it's grueling, and they're not getting the reinforcement they need to continue. How do you, what, should you say, as I've often said, if you can quit, quit? Or do you say there's a, a path that you can get through this? It's such a personal decision. I would be hesitant, you know, to, to advise somebody. It's like how when you're trying to pin a shrink down to tell you, you know, what, what you should do, and they just keep slipping out of it, and you're like, no, yes or no. I'm going to ask you a series of yes or no questions. Um, I think that it's going to be hard, you know. Everything worth doing is, is hard. Um, so how much can you take? Yes. And can you find, you have to have encouragement somewhere. You, 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 it's, yes. it's oxygen. There's, there's no, 
My yeah. friend uh, John Camps uh, calls it, you know, he said, I write three sentences and then I just wait for the praise train to pull in. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to have encouragement. And that's not just writing, it's anything. Where did you get it? Friends, you know, um, peers. I, I think that if you're in a spot where you want to, you wanna, you're trying to do this, it's not quite working out, continue to seek out community. Um, and you don't need a lot. You need one or two yeah. people who take your stuff seriously. And if you can't find anybody to take your stuff seriously, anybody at all, possibly you should rethink it, not because it's for anyone to say whether you have, you're untalented or talented or whatever, but just because it's, it's, it's making you too unhappy. And you can have a lot of happy lives that don't include screenwriting. Well, do you remember the day before you thought this is going to work? And the day after, when, what was it? What changed? Uh, there wasn't a day. There wasn't a day. Well, I can have a day that changed. Here's a okay, because I, it, it, you know, it's even though it happened quickly for me, it was still a process of getting the first independent movie made, getting the second independent movie made, and then writing a script that we thought would be an independent movie, but became Death Becomes Her. It was supposed to be like a $5 million weirdo, you know, indie thing. And it became a big studio thing from which I then ended up working on Jurassic Park. The day when I knew things were different, but I was too young to understand how, was uh, when Jurassic Park opened, I was in New York working on something else. And I, I lived in LA at the time, now I live in New York. And I walked back, <clears throat> I walked over to the Ziegfeld because it was 90 three and there's no internet and I wanted to see how the movie was doing so I walked over to the Ziegfeld to see if there was a line and a guy came on the loudspeaker and said the seven o'clock show of Jurassic Park sold out and I thought that's good and he said and the ten o'clock show sold out <laughs> and I said oh that's good and that's great we're a hit and then he said also the Saturday seven and ten o'clock shows of Jurassic Park are sold out <laughs> and I I was like that's I'm new here but that seems really good <laughs> and and I you know it was a it, it was a big hit, and I, things changed then. Mm -hmm. What I didn't understand about how they changed is, I then went from a career I had assumed would be these independent weirdo thrillers that I like to do, but then I had this great success at a studio, great big, you know, entertainment thing, and that changed what I pursued for a good long time. Mm. Um, because, you know, Hollywood's like, hey, that went well. If you do more of that, we'll give you this. Yes. You know, and and who, who among us can resist that? Yes. And so it's very hard. I had to make conscious efforts throughout, for the la you know, throughout uh, to mix it up and try something else, try something in the spirit of something else, something that they didn't think I could do, and try and, and, try and do what Charles Bukowski said, which is, you know, reinvent yourself and dodge mediocrity as much as you can by doing things until you think you're not good at them. And I've, I've tried to exercise creative muscles to the point of failure, uh, which I have done. I'm proud to say I've had a couple spectacular failures, which are unpleasant while they're going on, but I think they're good for you and you learn from them. What do you learn? Don't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I mean, these, there are people here, and I'm sure, you know, and they're going to face frustration. They're going to say, not only um, it's not failing, it's not getting to the point where it can fail. So I'm here alone, struggling like this, and I'm wondering why. What, uh, how do you keep? Well, you only can, if you're, if you're struggling, and you will always struggle, yeah. whether you are succeeding or not, uh, you will, everything is a struggle. It's always hard. Yeah. Whether you're struggling or not, you have to decide that you want to keep doing it because that's what you must do. If you don't feel like that's what you must do, then you must stop because it's, yes. it's not worth it. So it's really just, you don't have a choice. Do you find yourself, and it's not, I don't have a choice in the matter, I must, and therefore I'm in the office at 10 a.m. It's not like that. It's, it's more like you vow you're going to quit, and then you start doing it again. Four or five days later, you pick it up again. Yeah. That means you should be doing it because yeah. you can't stop. Yeah. But not in a bad way, in a good way. And, you know, I had a similar thing about acting, which is I wanted to act. I wanted to be Steve McQueen. He was, that's the only person to be. And 
But as soon as I had exactly the same thing happen, which is that I did it, I went to acting, and um, people said, you, you're terrible. You're just <laughs> absolutely terrible. And I took that very seriously, and I stopped. And then when I said, I want to write and direct, people said, well, that's you know, almost impossible. That won't happen for you. That's impossible. It meant nothing to me. And I think that maybe that's the thing. When you find the thing you must do, Nothing can discourage. And you're doing it anyway. Yeah. I mean, I, I have four kids, and, you know, we've slugged through a lot of teenage years. Yes. And trying to get them to be motivated to do something that you think they ought to do yeah. is a thankless, fruitless task. It's horrible. Impossible. But if there is a tiny glimmer that they think they ought to do it, yeah. there's no stopping them. Yeah. And, and that's the stuff to encourage. Yes. That's a great advice. Now tell me, we've talked a lot about being a working, very successful screenwriter, and yet even you, there's no one more successful, has had frustrations with the process, where you have a call, and they, they oh, they want it at 10 o'clock tomorrow. They really want to talk to you about the first act. And so for the next 12 hours, you just like, me, I guess, I had to take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck's wrong with the first act? <laughs> and you have to think about that on your own for 12 hours until yeah. the call. And then the call really doesn't happen until 2 o'clock because, oh, sorry, he got called into... Oh, I remember once I had submitted a thing to Johnny Depp, who you know, uh, to, and his we agent... We won't get into that. <laughs> we won't get into <laughs> that. But he, his agent told me... Um, Oh, you know, he had to practice with the band this week. You know, I'm right. waiting six weeks. I haven't heard a word, you know. I said, but you said, you know, I would hear something fine. Well, he's working with his band. Sure. And you're thinking like, fuck him. <laughs> I'm sitting here waiting second by second, and he's not even given a thought. And, the, yeah. The, we do not understand what the world is like for a movie star. No. It's a sick, sick place. Yes, it is. Where nothing is I questioned, for that. Yes. nothing is held accountable. You know, the greatest line of it all is in uh, Sunset Boulevard, Gloria Swanson comes to the stage yes. and she's being freaky and the crew's kind of laughing at her and Cecil B. DeMille tells him to shut up and he says, a dozen press agents working overtime can do terrible things to the human spirit. Yes. And it's, that's it. It's not the right way to live. No, it's, it's very terrible. Bad if you can you. survive that, you know, and they're the most privileged and coddled people in the world. But they tend to be really good looking and funny sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, we, we throw them up there. I hope everybody here has seen Sunset Boulevard, one of the great movies ever made, and written by Billy Wilder and I think I yelled Brackett, maybe that was their collaboration. But you can look at any movie that Billy Wilder wrote and say, oh, that's a course in screenwriting. That's perfect. That's wonderful. And you know what was interesting about him? There's a book I would also really recommend uh, reading, which is called It's the Pictures That Got Small. It's, it's Charles Brackett, his, one of his collaborators for 20 years, kept diaries <laughs> and said to his grandson, after I die, you can publish these. So Brackett died. His grandson published the diaries. Uh -huh. And they're about his period working with Wilder and how I was str they're fascinating. And I was struck by two things. One is how writing has not changed. You know, in his diary, he says, got in this morning, had an okay hour or two, Wilder got a call from some actress, and the day was lost. Yes. And uh, got in this morning, did okay, went to Lucy's for lunch, had three martinis, came back, took a nap, and the day was lost. Every, <laughs> so many entries end with, and the day was lost. Yes. And in, in, in our case, I would say, you know, went in this morning, started working, went over to the New York Times to read about blah, 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 then went over to the Washington Post for a while. <laughs> then I went to, you know, like, it's like a chain of six increasingly <laughs> debased uh, uh, internet websites. You know, looked up, it was four o'clock and the day was lost. Yeah. You know, that, that, there's that... That doesn't change. Loss of time, uh, bad habits, you know, self-loathing. Yes. All, all that has ever been part and process. never changes. So has anyone here felt self-loathing? No. <laughs>
Just... And it was I.L. Diamond and Charles Brackett. And that, yeah. that collaboration, those two collaborations, covered a lot of fantastic movies. They absolutely did. The second thing about the Brackett's book that, uh, uh, sorry to be tiresome, but it's a great book and you should read it. Um, the second thing is how quickly things moved in the 40s. Uh, Five Graves to Cairo, which is one of my favorite movies, um, they, is a World War II movie that they conceived. They had the idea in February. They went, they wrote it in about six weeks. They gave it to the head of the studio who said, fine, fine, that's good. We're going to put, you know, uh, so they put a couple actors on it. Uh, we got stages reserved for you, blah, blah, blah. It was in theaters in November. And I think that speed, it, I go quickly. I like to work quickly. And I think it's important. I think if you get stuck on something for years, put it aside, write something else and come back. But don't just sit there staring at it. Work work quickly. You have wonderful a lot of advice. ideas and see what works. Not always possible, but wonderful advice. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it just seems to take a lot longer than you thought, you know? We'd have a hard time collaborating because, <laughs> no, it's true, because I want to move on. And, yeah. And, and well, you're I want to like, move on. But this isn't good. Uh, yeah. This doesn't work very well yet. And I, and I would, would want to keep going. And then yeah. you'd want to talk to people, and I'd be like, don't talk to people. It'd be kind of funny. And you forgot Wikipedia, which didn't exist when we were starting. But once you start there, because you're reading something in the New York Times, and it mentions something, and it may have happened in 1938 or it may have happened last week, but you say, oh, I, I don't know about that. Let me go to Wikipedia. And once you start at Wikipedia, it's an endless rabbit hole. The links, right? you can, yeah, it's fantastic. Wikipedia is, is, I think, one of the best human accomplishments of the last 40 years. It's, it's all of us working together to try to have something that's accurate and true. And people yeah. used to be complain, well, it's inaccurate. Yeah. Yeah, but once a billion people start working really hard to make it accurate, it, 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 it's just an incredible it's resource. Amazing. Try to give them money because it's, it's worthwhile. Yeah. But the other thing, like Wikipedia, is YouTube. Because if you're reading an article in the New York Times, and it says in 1947, the matador so-and-so, was killed in Madrid. You think, like, well, I, that name sounds familiar. I want to hear how he died. <laughs> I gotta, in fact, I'd like to see it? a video. Yeah, <laughs> and you can see it. You can see it instantly. That didn't exist until recently. No, and it, it changes all our expectations about everything. I should be able to see everything I want is immediately. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the prevailing exactly. attitude. I don't well, know if I think that's Americans good for you have either. gotten that, which is... Oh, I'm so over this COVID. You know, really? How do you get, you're bored with it, right? So therefore it should be over? Well, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it, is, it is dull. It is, it is dull. <laughs> and it's an American thing, thinking everything unpleasant will be over. Is that just us? Isn't that sort of human nature? No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. All right, so here you have this gigantic directing, screenwriting career. What drove you to write Cold Storage, your first novel? Um, okay, so I'd had a couple things. I'd had a, um, I'd wanted to write something, I'd wanted to write a novel. I, for a while I just felt like, oh, I should. Um, that's something I haven't done. But then I started to, um, I started to feel like, no. But then I had a, a few experiences in a row, maybe working on kitchen cabinet jobs where I felt like I, I, I need some quiet. I, this is a little, this, I'm getting too many opinions. I'd like, to have, I'd like to have a few months where it's just me doing something that no one knows or cares that I'm doing. Um, and so I had an idea for a movie because all my ideas come in the form of movies because it's you know, what I've been doing for a long time. So Cold Storage showed up as a movie idea and I went, um, I, I went. I said, "Well, I'm going to write a little, I'll write a little prose, just to know these characters a bit. Because when you write prose, you have to make choices about characters that are." Had you written prose before? Yeah, but not for anybody else. Just for you know, like I'd write a character bio and I'd try to write it well, or write it about an episode that occurred in their life. Um, and so I started writing it, and within a page or two, I thought, "Well, this is just great. I can, I, I can not only, you know, because in a screenplay, you you can write." what the audience would see or hear. Anything else is cheating, and that's it. Um, 
And so you come up with images to suggest it, like the first line of the body heat screenplay, flames in the night sky. It says everything about the movie right away with an image. Um, but in a, in a book, you can write what someone's thinking or feeling. Or you can, for a paragraph, talk about their fifth grade teacher uh, or the first person they kissed. Yeah. And the only way you could do that in movies is if someone has monologue or you have a flashback to their first kiss. And I can't think of a worse flashback. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so I just started enjoying it. And I, was ha I just had a, I had a ball Did it feel it. like years of weight was being lifted off yes. your shoulder? Yes, I was gleeful. And mm -hmm. the tone of that book is somewhat gleeful yes. because it's... Uh, well, both these books, I will say, both of which deal with horrible things, are very funny, like all your work. And there is a glee to your pleasure in, A, the horror, and also um, the people. I mean, they're, even though they're about terrible things happening to the world, the people are seen with enormous empathy, sympathy, compassion. And that's what grounds all your work, I think. It's easier in a book, you know, to... to now, why is it exactly? Is it what you just said or because, you know, you can tell what they're thinking or what, what, what really are you actually think doing? I that. I think it's access to someone's thoughts uh, mm -hmm. and feelings. And in movies, you need, you need more than one person to do it really well. Um, you know, just absolutely indelible image of... You know, from Accidental Tourist is William Hurt's face at the end. Does it end on his close-up? I think it yes. does. And it's just absolutely beautiful. And it's because you wrote the moment and because you had the good sense to put the camera in the right place in the right size and because he was at the absolute peak of his powers. And it's just beautiful. Um, but God, that's an image of a person's face. And they're just... That's lightning in a bottle, and well done, you caught it. But in a book, you can talk about how he felt. Yes. Uh, and that I just think it, you just have greater access to someone's uh, heart. Yes, well, I was shocked reading Cold Storage because your facility seems so great. The level of achievement was quite high. For This is your first novel, and yet you seem to move with it as though all those pleasures that you're talking about came to you very easily. You know, now I can hear what they're thinking. Now I can go into their backstory. Now I can take this moment and explode it in time. And how did that, how did you know? Is it just such a relief after movies or what? I felt that. Well, I'd been reading novels uh, on my own since my early 40s. And um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, it didn't play right. I'm going to work on that. I'll work next, on that joke. Next appearance. Yeah, yeah, that, that needs workshopping. <laughs> um, I tried to tell a joke once around John Patrick Shamley, and yes. it absolutely died in front of eight people. Yes. And there was an awkward pause, and he said, it's in process. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was very generous. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, I just felt, I felt re released uh, from the tyranny of what they say and what they do. Yes. Um, and that was really fun. And the one thing you just referred to, explo to, to expand a moment, I could take, particularly if it's a moment of violence, to be able to attenuate it over six pages, something yeah. that would take two seconds in, in yeah. real life and have a little digression in the middle of it. Now I got really loud. Yeah. Have a little digression in the middle of it where some, you talk about quickly, you should know that when he was a child, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. the, the, the reader's like, come on, get to the thing. And so it's, it was a lot of fun. But now do you feel the reader? I mean, we know in movies there's enormous, no matter what the pace of the movie, I mean, it can be slam bang, we've both done that. It can be very slow and contemplative, we've both done that. But do you, you do feel, are we losing, we're gonna lose the audience here, this is taking too long, this is too... When you're writing a novel, do you think, I don't worry about that? No, I totally worry about you it. You do? Yeah, I, because you know, as readers, you know when you put the book down for the night, Yeah. And you know when you put the book down for the night and in your heart, no, you're not picking it up again. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want, I don't want that. Yes. I, I want you to, you know, want to keep moving. So I, 30 years of screenwriting doesn't just, those instincts don't just go away. Right. Um, so what I found challenging is in both books, um, and it's more pronounced in Aurora, is toggling between points of view and two stories that, are going to come together and the reader knows they're gonna to come together and you're, you, but you gotta intimate they're gonna to come together and you must always rejoin it at just the right 
moment yeah. before we've had too much or too little or we've been away from some, you know, that bad feeling when you say, yeah. what happened to Valjean? I haven't seen yeah. him in 50 pages. Yes. Um, I don't know why I'm picking on Victor Hugo. Well, but, you, know. He, you know, how good is he? <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, that's, no, pace is, is, is certainly on my mind. Well, when you finish Cold Storage, and I recommend it to everybody because it's a page turner and just moves like a shot, and it's very funny and very horrifying. But when you were done with that, and you had now succeeded in writing a novel, and people were responding well to it. What did you think about the next novel? Well, I had an idea mm -hmm. that I wanted to write, and um, I. Uh, the, the, it took me a year to get to it, or maybe two, uh, from the time I finished Cold Storage, um, because they require, you know, all writing requires vast amounts of time sitting alone, wait, procrastinating. That just is what's required yeah. to get yourself in that state of heightened concentration. Yeah. And a novel takes even more. You know, if you go really fast, it's four, four months, maybe, um, or for me. And that, you know, to clear that space and to say, I'm going to live with only this story for this amount of time, um, takes some doing. And um, so it took me a little bit to get to it. Uh, but I had an idea, and I knew I wanted to write it. But it's an idea I'd been thinking about for 30 years, since the first movie I directed was about a blackout. And this is also about a blackout, although on a much grander scale. Yeah. Do you say, I'm going to write the entire length of this story, and then I'm going to write the entire length of that story, and then I'll mix them up in a perfect way? Or do you go back and forth in the writing? Back and forth in the writing. Because it's always as much of knowing when you want to go to the other person is just as big a you know, uh, um, writing job as writing that other person's story. I mean, you thought them through, ideally, but, you know, uh, to get really plumber's convention about it, outlining process, I think, I think is best done, a book takes a little bit longer, but for a screenplay, um, I think an out, once you've thought about it and re done your research and, you know, come up with your characters and basically know the world, I think you should slap an outline down in two days um, and, and then start. Yeah. And when you get to page 10, you should reassess your outline because mm -hmm. now you've been thinking more deeply about it. Flesh this out, move that over there. This is really still unformed. I don't know what I'm going to do there, but it'll be good. Um, and, and do that every 20 pages or so, I find I'm revising the outline yeah. so that I don't really have a completely finished outline until I finish the script. Do you outline in enormous detail first? And it's just I gleeful typing to. it up at that point. Used to, and then stopped, and then... Stuff got worse and worse, but it's really good to outline because it takes away that feeling of first when you sit down, which is, what am I going to do today? Yeah. Yeah. And so if you have an outline, you know what you're going to do. You may change it. You may veer away from it. You may be appalled by what you thought was going to happen, but it's something to hang on to. And I find the first three sentences, the that is the fence. That's the hurdle to get over. Yeah, and I think that's why, you know, there have been a million screenwriting books, and the one that I still think is uh, preeminent is Sid Field's screenplay from the, like, late 70s. Um, because, I mean, he's insanely dogmatic. Uh, he tells you this must happen, and it must happen on page 17, which is ridiculous. But, but he, he provides, he says, look, stories tend to have a beginning, middle, and end. The beginning tends to be about yay long, the middle gets longer, and then the end is shorter again. And I think, as with life, that's true. Um, and it's, it's all from Aristotle, you know, it's just the basic three-act structure of a story. But what it did was, or for me anyway, is it provided something that I could either embrace or rebel against. I could say, yep, that's right, and I'm going to do it, or yes. I could say, that's completely wrong, and I'm doing it differently, and here's why. But without starting with that thing, whether it's your own outline or someone else's theory, yeah. what are you going to do? You know, yeah. It's too amorphous. The world's too big. And yet you hear about great writers who say, well, I never know. You know, I, I'm, I just But start. are they full of shit? <laughs> are they? I think they know. 
You I, do. I, I never know what I'm doing. I just sit down and take dictation <laughs> from the gods. No, they say, you know, I want to be surprised every minute. And I, I don't, I agree with you. It's not that easy. I, yeah. Yeah, no, I'd like to, uh, it, there, those are wonderful moments in writing when something you didn't expect happens. Yes. I, I once had a character plan till the end and just in a moment of malice killed him on 55. And it was great. It was really fun. I well, can't, I well, can't you remember. Got if it irritated with him? Uh, I just thought it would be fun and surprising, you know, because sometimes you're thinking, what's the last thing I expect here? Uh, yeah. And I certainly didn't expect that. And so that's fun, but those moments are rare. I don't know, sitting around waiting for, waiting for those to happen. I, well, with Aurora, how much detail did you have in your mind about what was going to happen? Um, quite a bit in a general sense. But again, because a book is, is much longer, many stories develop over the, in the course of the book. Um, and those just kind of come out when you're working on it. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. You know, and so, but I think you have to have a general sense of where you're going. The, the first guy I wrote professionally with, Martin Donovan, um, we did Apartment Zero and, and Death Becomes Her. And we ultimately stopped working together after that because we were just very different. Those were the ones we had in common. We did them and, you know. Had you gone to school together? No, no, no. He's from 14 years older than me and from Argentina. And we'd met, long story, through this internship I had. And... Um, he, we, we just started kicking stories and movie ideas around together. And, but what we ultimately broke up over, uh, you know, as a writing team, was we had a big fight one day because I wanted to write something, and he said, no, I, I didn't want to write it. I wanted to finish outlining, and he wanted to write. And I said, well, I don't, I, I don't know what happens on page three until I know where we're going. And he said, how can I possibly know where we're going if I don't know what happens on page three? And that was the difference between, yeah. between us. Yeah. I liked yeah. outlining, he didn't. So what would you recommend to people who are not as far along? People who maybe started reading novels when they were younger than 40, and people who are trying <laughs> to get into movies. Tell, tell me, what, what would you say? What advice would you give them? I, think, I read something once, and I don't remember who said it, mm -hmm. but I, I, I put it up over my desk for a good 10 years. Mm-hmm. And it said, try to fall in love with the daily process of putting words on paper. Yeah. So that tells you how long ago it was wow. somebody said it. Um, because that's the part you can control. Yeah. And that was why I wanted to write. I could control it. I didn't need someone's permission to write a script. I didn't need to be yes. cast. I didn't need to be given the thing to direct. I could do it. And... If and when, you, at what moment did you feel that? Was it starting cold storage, or was this on your screenwriting? I've always felt it. I enjoy a nice sentence, um, uh -huh. and whether it's an email or you know uh, a book. But it's if you can enjoy it on a daily basis, you win. Yes. And if you've won, uh, that will be infectious, and it will show in your writing. But yes. it, you know, if you can actually, it's hard though. It's very hard to be patient. And, and enjoy it, especially if you don't know if it's going to lead to something or not. Yes. Um, but that's what we all put up with and must, you know, you got to keep doing it. Yeah. That's the hard part, I think, um, because there's so little reinforcement at the beginning. So you're just in there struggling. It's not working. And no one even knows what you're doing. They, you don't understand what you're trying to do, really. I mean, as you say, I want to write screenplays. Most civilians in the world don't know what that means. Yeah. So you're in a room alone, miserable. In my case, I was doing it at night because I was working during the day to support a family. And you're miserable all the time, except you're doing it 24 hours a day, you know. And you say, well, how can I keep going? And I, I, what, what keeps you going? Um, that it makes you happy in some way, mm -hmm. um, whether that happiness, it, it, or it makes you miserable, but that's actually kind of happy, uh, uh, you know, a weird kind of misery happiness. Yeah, talk uh, about that a little bit. Well, um, it's, 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 it's fun to struggle with a story, mm -hmm. and the, the only thing that's bad is telling other people about it. 
Um, mm -hmm. You can tell them I'm struggling, but for God's sake, don't tell them your story problem. Right. Because <clears throat> they don't care. Um, they, they won't fix it. Hmm. And sometimes you talking it out will help, but 90% of the time it won't. And yes. all it does is remove the desire um, to yes. write. You yes. Know? I, I try I'd really hard not to tell new ideas to people. Yes. Because then why write it? Yes. Told it. And, you know, that's such a article of faith for me that, but I wonder if people get that, that you have dispersed all the energy the minute you tell your friend, your wife, whatever, this is what I'm going to do. You might as well give up on the whole project. Yeah, I think. Well, because you're, the, the desire to tell this is yes. what, but you've told it. Yes. So, you know, and then also you ruined, now they can't read it. Yes. Because they know what it, they know what's going to happen, um, and so you've ruined the creative uh, value of it. Yeah. I have an actor friend who believes in it so profoundly. He won't tell me what he's working on, mm -hmm. um, and he's a prominent actor. And I say, but you know, I could Google it now, <laughs> and I could find out. And he said, I don't care. You'll do what you'll do. I can't help that. You know, and blah blah blah. And then, I'm so not going to ruin while it. While we're talking, I say, oh, you're doing that thing with, uh, you know, because I just did Google it and I see what you're doing and. and Anyway, but is he, he, it's try, is, is he what? Is he mad when that happens? Does he feel that some energy has been released into the cosmos? I think he was secretly daring me to Google it because he wanted me to know, but he didn't want to say it because he's British. <laughs> and they, you know, they're, they're complex. So um, when you, this Jurassic Park moment happened, yeah. and did you think, were you married and did you have kids? I was married, I got married young, I was <clears throat> 27 the first time I got married. Um, and so I was married and I didn't have kids yet. I had a kid uh, a year or two later. No, three years later. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, I, when you just said you were, you know, when you were writing screenplays and working a, I assume, disreputable day job um, and trying to support a family, um, Larry, I already respected you, but I respected <laughs> you even more. No, because that's, uh, that takes nerve, you know, because you, it's not just you and you don't care what apartment you live in and you don't care if you yeah. have bad food. Um, there's other people that are depending on you, yeah. and you're trying to do this thing, and that, that's hard. That, that must have been a lot of, a lot of pressure. Yeah. I mean, you're okay now, mm -hmm. obviously. It worked out. <laughs> but, but no, that's, it's very, very hard. You're trying to deal with life's pressures and you're trying to pursue this thing that's a dream. Yeah. But. Yeah. Well, that's true of probably everybody here, right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to, we are going to go to the Q&A in a second, but you and I discussed this this morning, which is, I just saw it today, which is a quote from Henri Matisse, the great French painter. And he says, and this is about the work, and he says, the essential thing is to work in a state of mind that approaches prayer. Now, when you and I, that approaches prayer, and when you and I discussed this today, we, said, I, we both said, well, I'm not religious, but I get it. When you go into your room, and you're sitting there with your computer, it, it, does that happen to you? What is the, the analogous thing for you? It's it's a yeah I'm not I'm not uh, uh, prayerful but I believe you know in in you're trying to achieve to write or I assume produce any piece of art you're trying to achieve a heightened state of concentration right and I will it's why you know Matisse should thank his lucky stars the internet wasn't around <laughs> when he was painting right <laughs> because um, it's we all. You're trying to avoid disruption because you've got to get, you know, when your mind is engaged on a certain, you know, inspiration occurs during composition. It doesn't just strike out of nowhere. You're, you're there working and you've re gotten rid of all extraneous distractions to the extent that you can and you're working on this thing and then it starts to flow. It's what, you know, athletes have a similar thing. It's when you're in the flow, you're in the zone, something is going well because you're using as much of your brain on this topic as you can and not on the others. However, and so I agree with that wholeheartedly, what 
the problem that we have now is we are each and every one of us in a pitched battle, primarily with our phones. We can handle our, our computers, I think. Our phones are, are, are vicious, vicious vampires. Um, you know, we agreed to carry the tracking device with us at all times. And, you know, we agreed to get involved with these uh, platforms that are, you know, designed by minds greater than our own to monopolize our attention and ruin our attention, our, our, our ability to concentrate. And I, it, it's going, to, it wrecks us. So taking every step I possibly can, I use an app called Freedom. You should download it and give them 20 bucks if you can. Um, you can turn off the internet for a specified amount of time on all your devices. Wow. And there's no way to, to turn it back on once you click yes. Wow. So um, I usually pick an hour, which is about what I can stand. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, I, and, and then I immediately find I start working within about 90 seconds, because otherwise I'm, just sitting, at, I'm yeah. just sitting there. I don't know what I would, you know. And does the hour go quickly, or are you thinking, I can't wait to see what happened during this hour? Or slow, 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 <laughs> super fast. And then it's over, and you go, oh, I can check my email. And, you know, you're like, And then do you turn so it on fulfilled. again? Um, and then I, or has the I turn it on again. If, if things are going well, I don't need to turn it on again. Mm -hmm. um, but things usually don't go. I mean, I don't, maybe I'm. No, I think a lot of people share this problem. It's a, it's, it's, it's an incredibly distracting world. Yeah. Um, so I try every trick in the book to stay in that state. I put my, if I need my phone, I put it somewhere I at least have to get up and walk over to get it. Um, and turn off the computer's internet. You know, it, but it's a constant, constant battle. All right, so, so let's go back know. for That's one second before the Q&A to, to Charles Brackett, when he said, another lost day, right? Whether it was the three martinis or Wilder having more fun than he was because <laughs> You always think the director is having more fun. Well, than see, it. that's very good. I assumed he was just complaining about Wilder being in a bad mood, and you, you see, this is why you're a better writer. You went to he's jealous. He's jealous. Well, of you the said that he's jealous. talking to an actress. Yeah. <laughs> and screenwriters very rarely get that call. Oh yeah, no, that. Yeah, directors don't get think that. they ever get that. Yeah. Call. So he was jealous. But when you have a day, and you, do you ever say another last day? Yes. Yes. And, and how, how does it affect your next day? Uh, I feel enough, normally I feel enough of a sense of shame and panic that I come in and get, get serious more quickly. What I found, um, I find family life useful because, you know, talk about distractions, they, they do that, God love them, but if I've killed a day and it's getting up on like four o'clock, yeah, yeah. and I know it really is time for me to pretty soon rejoin the family. <laughs> I start writing like a maniac. Yes. So between four and six, I get a lot done. Yes. Just from panic. And you know, whatever motivates you, you gotta, you gotta go with it. Absolutely. That's maybe the most important thing he said. Um, there's one David Kep quote that has guided me. Um, this is when you've succeeded to the extent that you're in working in Hollywood. So that's already a triumph. Right, that you're working, and then, but he said um, this was some miserable moment for one of us, maybe both of us at the same time, and and he said Hollywood exists for one purpose, to make you miserable, and I think that's the one absolute truth. It's a that, giant feel bad machine. Yes, <laughs> that's that that's what it's meant to yes. do, and you see, you know, if a and, and at any level, yeah. uh, you know, a friend will get nominated for an Oscar. Yes. Uh, which sounds like it's great. Yeah. Uh, you know, it hasn't happened to me, but yeah. it, it sounds like it's a wonderful thing. It's happened to you. But then you hear stories of the three months of slogging out there, and you go and you know you're going to lose, but something tells you you're going to win, and of course you're not going to win. The other one's going to win because they're better looking. <laughs> And, yes. it, and then you gotta, and the room slowly turns into a room 80% full of losers yes. as the night goes on. Yes. And everything, at no matter what level, it yes. is, is designed to make you feel bad. I yes, feel. absolutely right. Okay, so Ted. But it's still a fun way to make a living. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, Ted. So we have time for a few questions. Just a quick reminder, questions at Live Talks Los Angeles typically start with a W or an H, sometimes <laughs> A D. They are generally short, and there is no such thing as a two-part question. 
Um, while you're thinking of your questions, one just came in uh, online, and the question is, David, um, will you be adapting Aurora for the big screen? And as you're writing the novel, do you worry yourself about what the adaptation might look like? Um, I am, yes, Ar Aurora is uh, going to be directed by Catherine Bigelow, the fantastic director of Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty and many others, and um, for Netflix. And um, we're hoping to start shooting in the spring. So I'm, I'm in the second draft of the script now with her, um, and it's, uh, it's going very well. Um, so I'm, I'm happy about that. And um, what, I missed the other part, sorry. What was it? As you're writing the novel, does oh, your concerns- Oh, does the screenplay ever occur to me? I would be lying if I said it didn't, but I, I do try to keep it out of my head and let it be a book. Um, but again, those are some very ingrained instincts. So I am thinking about what a script might look like. Like It's a lot of work and it's a different kind of thinking. So I, I do try to put those thoughts out of my head and just let it be a book um, because that's hard enough. you know. And sure enough, as I'm now, when you write the script, if you're doing a good job, you're, you are interpreting your book. You're not just typing up the movie version of your book. You're, because there's such different media, it, it has to be an interpretation and it has to be different. So, yes. Hi, uh, thank you both for coming today. I'm really inspired by both of your works. Um, I had a question about outlining since you both uh, kind of mentioned it. Um, I'm about to start a new project. And I was curious, um, what is your preferred method of outlining, and how do you know when it's time to put away the outline and start writing? Well, I used to do it when I was doing it a lot. I did it on cards, which is something I was told you should do on index cards. And I would put them up on the wall. And then what's great is, it's like film editing, you can move them around and you try different orders. And it was, as I said before, comforting to go into that room in the morning and know, well, I'm here. Because I, I know I've done those, I've X'd them out, I've turned them over. What about you? The very same. I, I, think, uh, I think cards are great. Um, I love them because you, you can write as little or as much detail as you want. Um, and I, just to get really pedantic about it, because you know, this is what we do, um, I like a coffee table because I can look down at it and I can see about how long that is and about how long that is and where that might happen. I don't like putting them on a wall because you have to unpin it to move it and it's a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah. So I like to slide them around and be able to look at it. Um, and I also like if it's a movie that has, if the, one of the values of the movie is action or suspense, well, all movies have suspense, but um, you know, some sort of, um, songs, not that I've ever done one of those, but you know, I, I would put a little color, like some red, so, yeah. I, so I can look and see, wow, for, for an action film, there's about 65 pages with no action in them. That doesn't yeah. seem like it's a good idea. Um, yes. So I, I, I really think cards are important. When to move on to writing, if you're thinking maybe it's time to go to writing, it's time to go to writing. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean you're abandoning your outline, it's finished, it's set in stone. You know, as I was saying before, you can start writing, do 10 pages, see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Really, that's the best advice anybody can ever give is try 10 pages and see how it goes. Because then all those thoughts that came out in the 10 pages, maybe they're perfect 10 pages and they'll never change. Or maybe there's a half page in there that really represents what you want to do but it will inform you and increase your state of concentration. So. And do you ever think, end a day and think, you know, this was crap today, I just did crap. And then you read it the next morning, you think, that's not so bad. Does that happen to you? Yes, yes. Normally, I'll, I don't think it's not so bad about all of it. Like, your <laughs> hunch that it's crap is usually has some basis in reality. Yes. But there will be a chunk. You go, okay, well, yeah, no, that wasn't so good. But this, this is kind of working. Yeah. I also have had the more dispiriting experience of ending thinking it's great and reading it the next day and realizing <laughs> that's, that's, not yes. a, that's not wonderful. All right. Question, Ted? 
Um, sure. Could you guys just uh, talk a little bit about your day-to-day -day process in terms of writing? Like you started talked about getting into the office at 10 a.m. That you do most of your writing between four and six. Like what? What's the process in terms of how you design your workspace? How you design your day? Is there a consistency to it? How's and how has that evolved over time? Um, well, it's you know it's an office job. Um, I used to when I was younger. Uh, I used to write at night because it's quiet. And, um, you know, phone doesn't ring, and I would write till 4 in the morning, and it was great. Uh, then I had kids. That, that changes. And it orients you more toward whenever they're at school. Um, so, you know, I write, in, I write in the day. I think you consistently have written at night. Yeah. And Almost your... everything and all the time. And... And it wasn't because I didn't. I intended every morning to write during the day. <laughs> Isn't that it? It, it just wouldn't. Oh my God! How did it get to be nine p.m.? <laughs> That's odd. Well, I better get to work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's yeah. That's I. I go in and I, you know, or I if I currently I have an office at home, so I walk down the hall, um, and I. You know, you do email, you do the things you got to do to get ready and clear the decks a little bit to write. Then I spend so much time wasting time on the internet until I feel this powerful shame and self-loathing <laughs> where, where the pain of writing is actually going to be less than the pain of what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and and then, I, then I write. I have to one, ask you one thing because of what you described. If you had all your cards on a coffee table mm -hmm. and... Suddenly, the, wind, the window blew out. It was a David Kep movie, and everything went to shit all of a sudden. <laughs> and all the cards got blown onto the floor. Do you think you would put them back in the same order? Um, no, you'd make it better. <laughs> it's like when you lose a file, and, yes. you, and you, have to, you have to redo it. It's yes. better. Because yes. uh, you've already internalized all that, yes. and now you're applying another layer of thinking on top of it. All right. um, but I do photograph them. You Sometimes did. when they're there, yeah, I'll just go like that and take That's a picture. That's great. I don't. Brilliant. Yeah, I don't want Genius. It. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, I had a question for both of you. What is the ratio of the number of screenplays that you have finished to the number of screenplays of yours that have actually been produced? Hmm. hmm. Well, you know, I, when I was starting, I had a really. It took you know, I had written seven screenplays before I sold anything. Then once I started selling, everything got made. It was like really weird for a while. And um, I would meet screenwriters and they'd hate me, you know? It's not a likable story No, so it's far. not something. <laughs> but then of course, that, you know, attrition happens and pretty soon you have a bunch of things that weren't made, you know? But I, I couldn't tell you what the ratio is. 54. No, <laughs> uh, I don't know, it's about, uh, it, uh, yeah, similarly, none of you, everybody has a zero for whatever batting streak at the beginning because that's how it must start. Um, and then I'd say, and then I too had a period where it seemed like everything went and I assumed, well, this is how it is. Yes. And then life catches up with you and says, hold on, I haven't <laughs> even started having fun with you yet. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'd say in, it's probably about 50%, in it, but it continues to this. Of the specs I write now, I would say a third to a half get made, which is great. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's also, you know, given the number of people I've worked with and the, you know, how well many things have gone, I still write movies that I think are, would be uh, great, big, wonderful movies, and nobody wants to do it. Um, so that will always be the case. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I, I had a question about, I'm over here, sorry. Oh, there you go. Um, adapting Stephen King, both of you have, have adapted him, and I was just curious, um, uh, in adapting him, if you approach him differently than other writers that you've adapted, or just kind of how you tackled him? The King. What'd the King. Yeah. Um, the, I, first of all, I love Stephen King. He's like one of the great people. And um, I had, I sh probably shouldn't have done it. I uh, loved every moment I had with Stephen. Uh, everything about the movie was a disaster. <laughs> and um, 
I, I associate that disaster with his name, but personally, he's a hero to me. He's a great, great, lovely, generous man. He is uh, that too. I, I, I directed a, I wrote and directed a movie from a novella of his called Secret Window. <clears throat> Secret Window, Secret Garden, we shortened it. Uh, and it was a perfectly fine movie. He was, he was very, um, he was wonderful. He's got every approval in the world. Um, and he wants to hear from you once or twice. Uh, and then he wants to see it. Uh, but he wouldn't dream of telling you how to do it. Um, he might make a suggestion or two, you know, but really doesn't care if you do it or not. And because he understands, like the best novelists I've worked for don't, don't so much care how the movie turns out because they're on to writing something else. And they know that unless you buy and burn every single copy of their book, it'll always exist. You're doing something else and it must be you. Yeah. Um, and then, so he was, I also found him lovely. Um, and then um, he read both my books and has written a, a, you know, a nice blurb about them, which is he does, he reads so many people's books that he doesn't have to read. Yeah. And it's and very generous, generous enough to about comment them. about them. Yes. You know? So he's, yeah, he, he, he does no wrong in my book. He's a saintly guy. No. And our final question for the evening. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you so much for coming and happy um, almost birthday. Thank you. <laughs> what were um, some jobs that you did before you got your big break? And if you can describe your process of writing and still keeping that passion alive. Um, well, they were so exciting. Did you have awful first jobs that, you know, you'd rather not talk about? No, I, I, when I, you know, when I was growing up and they were just I'll novels, you know, the flyleaf of every novel would say, Ken Kesey worked as a lumberjack in a coal mine. He was a delivery man for, you know, uranium. Every novelist had that, had that kind of thing. And you say, oh my God, I'll never have those experiences. And this guy's obviously written based on his vast experience. I had terrible jobs like that in a glass factory and so on. But the thing that really saved me, I think, was I had a decent job that I despised. And I always tell people, get a job that you aren't confused that you're gonna stay there. You know, it should be something you hate. That will keep you on track. Yeah, yeah. Are you referring to jobs we had prior to any writing jobs or early writing jobs? Oh, okay. Um, I had a, so when I was at UCLA, I started an in internship working for a guy who was a, <clears throat> a, dis a distributor's rep. So he, and I was his assistant, and that was the whole office I worked in his kitchen. And um, we represented foreign film distributors, like um, an Australian video distributor. And we would buy US titles, B and C movies, uh, um, for distribution in foreign countries. Like Sorority House Massacre 3 was a big hit in, uh, in Australia. We bought that. So I would go to... I actually went to the Cannes film market with him when I was 25, and I was like, I'm at Cannes. And I went up to the Palais with the big carpet in front, and I said, I'm supposed to go in the Palais. And they said, no, 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 no you're the, mar the Marché. And it's in the basement, <laughs> which is where they sell all the porn and stuff. <laughs> and we did handle a certain amount of softcore porn as well. Which, so it was, and I made, first I made no money, and then I made $150 a week. Um, and he paid me in weed once or twice, which was kind of weird, you know, but I had a lot of he, friends. What, what was that? He paid me in pot a couple times, <laughs> which was weird, but I had a couple friends and <laughs> it would work out. Um, and that was bad. But I really learned, I read a lot and I saw a lot of terrible movies. And what I learned from it was I, I, I felt I can do better than that. And I think that it's important to think that. And yeah. it, it's hard when you go see a masterpiece uh, yeah. or even a pretty good Hollywood movie to think I can do better than that. Yeah. It takes a lot of nerve. But if you see some terrible stuff and read some bad scripts, you think, I, I can yeah. definitely do better than that. Um, and then so the first money I got for writing, uh, through him there was a guy whose girlfriend was a professional mud wrestler and he wanted to write a script for her 
uh, about mud wrestling. So I was, I was paid $3,000, largely just because I had gone to UCLA and they thought that sounded fancy. So I was paid $3,000 to write a female mud wrestling movie called Scissors. <laughs> so, you know, but it was exciting. Uh, not so much the mud wrestling stuff, but the, I got dollars to write, a, to write something. Yeah. And it was uh, terrible. Uh, and I'm sure it was an awful, awful script, and of course it never got made. But, uh, you know, I paid a few bills, and then I, after that, had an opportunity to write a movie called Slaughterhouse 2. Um, <laughs> and that was when I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. I would rather, I would rather not have money, um, <laughs> whatever that's like. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, you, you can, you, it was, but it was thrilling to just get any money to write anything. And thankfully, I didn't have to do that for too long. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.